Welcome to the Faders Up Podcast. I'm Czar, and this is a podcast about pro audio and beyond. If you have a question you want answered on the podcast, you can reach us at FadersUpPodcast at Yahoo.com. You can join us on Instagram at Faders Up Podcast, and you can join the discussion for this episode and more on our Facebook group, Faders Up Podcast. And don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and all guests and hosts that appear on the show will be in the show notes. So I am back here. Again, no O'Shea or Desiree for this episode, but I've got a guest here. We've got Touchtone DSG in the building with us. Yo, yo, what's cracking, everybody? Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem at all. I uh, always like to uh, talk about how we met, and I believe we met at NAM. was it last year? Yes, not this the year past before NAM, that. The, the previous, yeah, the previous NAM before that. Is it 2023? Uh, 2023. That okay, one, yeah, the, yeah, the off, well, I guess we'll call it the off cycle <laughs> NAM. I don't know if that's what we're going to unofficially call it, but yeah, the NAM yeah. in April, which was really weird in a way <laughs> yes it was it felt weird but yeah but yeah definitely at least they had it because the what that COVID year i think was it was it virtual something oh was virtual God. yeah it, it was a virtual nam one year yep yeah that sucked <laughs> yeah it's like y'all should just canceled it right, right. <laughs> really <laughs> <laughs> try again next year yeah because um yeah, Summer Nam. They tried. They went ahead and did Summer Nam, and that didn't go out so good. And you see what happened with that. R.I.P. to Summer Nam. <laughs> yeah, man. R.I.P. You know, uh, they they tried some things, and they're like, ah, it didn't work. You know, so let's get back to a regularly scheduled program for sure. <laughs> right. So, for those who don't know, you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I go by Touchtone DSG. That's the uh, DSG stands for the Sound God. Um, I've been in music, I've been producing and recording and mixing music now for a better part of 20 plus years, uh, from Phoenix, Arizona. I've worked with artists from, ooh, Jodeci, E-40, uh, Graydon Square, a bunch of local acts. I mean, I could go on, the list goes on and on. Um, went to the conservatory recording arts, uh, and sciences, you know, did my internship, I uh, came back and the landscape had changed as far as uh, engineers go because during that time it was the crossover between digital and analog. So a lot of studios closed. So you had to like maneuver differently. And this is the time that, um, what's that one website? Not not SoundCloud, but where everyone used to sell the beats or whatever. I forget the name of the site, but uh, SoundClick. And, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, SoundClick those days. So you had to maneuver differently. And I've just been doing things ever since, you know. Uh, got my own YouTube channel now, uh, doing pretty good numbers on, on Spotify, and I'm, I'm feeling a certain type of way about that now because they changed their <laughs> little policies over there. Uh, but, yeah, man, you know, and I just I just continue to work and get better, and, and that's, that's pretty much it, yeah. All right. Uh, tell me a little bit about, um, what is this, C-R-A-S? Crass, yeah. Um, I got accepted there, um, and – kind of not at the last second but i'd i got accepted there i was looking at it going out there and then it just kind of i was like man i know nobody out there and i don't know i don't know i, I don't know about this and i ended up uh so i'm from memphis um i ended up going to art institute of tennessee nashville the, obviously in nashville and i was like yo if things go south, I'm only 200 miles from Memphis. <laughs> I can get back home, but right. Uh, yeah, tell me, tell me how was how was that experience there? You know, so I went back in 2011, 2012, and the the experience now, looking back on it, it's like I asked myself, would I go into debt for it now? The answer would be <laughs> no. <laughs> um, now, <laughs> uh, but but the experience was was super cool. Because, like, in high school, man, I didn't try. I, I mean, I barely graduated just because I didn't care about high school. And then when I got to Crass, like, I graduated with a 4.0, you know, because <laughs> uh, it was something I was interested in. And the, the overall experience was a very positive one. I met a lot of lifelong friends there. I uh, met a life, like, a lot of connections, learned from some absolute Jedis. Uh, when it comes to audio engineering and the business side of it, uh, but the the cost to ROI on that 
is like, you know, it's like any other schooling. It's going to be mm-hmm. bu- much more expensive up front. So you get, if you don't have the money lying aside, you're going to have to get some grants, some loans, and things like that. And me being more financially responsible now, I most likely wouldn't do that. But the experience itself was one of those things. I wouldn't say it was once in a lifetime, but it's one of those things. It's like going to NAM every single day. You're like a bunch of you're around a bunch of like minded people that think the same and you're all working toward one goal. And that's that's kind of really cool. Mm -hmm. Man, we've we've got a lot in common because I did the bare minimum in high school as well, just because I knew I had no intentions of going to college because Mm -hmm. my beef with college is that high school is free. You can teach me whatever you want. College, I'm paying you, but I have to take classes that has nothing to do with what I want you to teach me. (laughs) Like my, um, and part of the reason I chose art Institute of Tennessee, Nashville is because let's say I had four classes a quarter uh, three or four classes a quarter. Three of those classes, let's say I had four, three of those classes were audio classes. And then one class was like English, math, psychology, um, literature, you know, whatever. Um, whereas with a traditional college, it, it's flipped. I had a, a friend that went to MTSU the same time I started Art Institute. And I don't know, let's say six months in, he calls me and is like, you know, how's it going? And I'm like, Oh, it's going great. We're already, I'm already in the studio. Um, and he's like, oh, well, um, yeah, you know, once I finish these classes, um, you know, I'll get in the studio too if I get in the program. I said, what do you mean if you get in the program? <laughs> like, you're paying them, right? <laughs> you're paying them to teach you audio, but you mean if you get in the program. So mm-hmm. I was like, no. Uh, and at Art Institute, I, and I'm sure you, like I had already taught yourself a lot on your own that (laughs) really made school easy in a way. Like for me, the first two years, like the studio stuff, I knew a lot of that. Um, The the second two years was like TV and film or audio for TV and film, audio for video games. Like that's the stuff I didn't know. I'm like, oh, let's let's learn that. I have no idea about that. Uh, So, but yeah, I... I loved Art Institute uh, for that because the majority of your class, like from day one, you're taking classes that has to deal with your major. And that's what I wanted. That's why I had no interest in going to a, a traditional college because, you know, you're not making me take classes that has nothing to do with what I'm paying you to teach me. Right. Right. I uh, I, I share a lot of sediments of your journey there. Um, the I had hit a glass ceiling with recording and I had like completing an album, was recording other people's stuff, and I didn't quite know what and how to use compression. YouTube wasn't as vast back in 2011, 2012. It was hardly any information on that. EQs, mm-hmm. why do you use them versus how do you use them? Um, and just learning the, the lot of the philosophies when it comes to mixing. So I was hitting a glass ceiling with, with my recordings. I knew how I wanted it to sound, but I couldn't quite get it there. So yeah, when I when I went to Crass, a lot of the information I, I knew already, but it was like those little nuggets, those fill-ins. This is mm-hmm. this type of compressor, and this is why this works this way. This is a VCA, this is an opto, this is a FET. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. But then when it came to like live sound, um, recreating the Avatar movie and Pro Tools and lining that up, like that was foreign to me, but I learned a lot, uh, especially about like, okay, video games when someone steps on grass it triggers this event so then the grass sound would trigger on this and i'm like oh okay cool cool you know um i didn't follow that but it was cool to learn you know Mm -hmm. um and then and as far as like the music business i didn't know uh, hardly enough and then when i went to crass they taught us about like just in the like indemnifications um what perpetuity means i didn't know that <laughs> you know so <laughs> i've seen that in a couple contracts like oh that's what that meant all right cool cool mm-hmm. uh and just learning that that type of business so then when you get out you learn about split sheets um you learn about percentages and stuff and you just you're better equipped to handle what comes your way and i feel like that that part of it now 
is extremely important uh, because everything online is less about the art now and more about the business. Uh, mm-hmm. I shouldn't say everything. That's such a generality. But a lot of the music stuff is about the business. So if you're going to upload something to DistroKid and it's a remix, you better learn the laws. You better learn the copyright laws. You you better learn like all of the stuff that you need uh, because you, you open yourself up for exposure and you're not really protecting your investment and in something you poured a lot of time into just because you didn't take the time to learn that. Mm. Message. Definitely. Yeah. All right, we're going to uh, get into our regular segment of who's been pushing faders up. We briefly uh, discuss what we've been working on. Uh, so I have been, uh, I, I just got it today, but I am, I'm going to be reviewing the uh, IK Multimedia iRig Stream Mic Pro, uh, which is a, a USB mic that not only works with Mac and Windows, but it also works with iOS and Android. And I want to check this out because... Uh, so when I go to NAMM and I try to do some content, like the last couple of years, I've taken uh, interface, condenser mic, like all of that. And I was thinking like, man, if I had a, a good USB mic, <laughs> that'll, I, that won't, I'll have no need for the interface and, you know, just uh, a whole lot, uh, what's the word, you know, condensing and just packing less of what I need. So yeah. uh, definitely looking forward to uh, checking that out. And I see it also has an aux input as well. So um, I can run other sources into it. It's got loop back. Uh, it has a mute button on the front, which I find nice. a lot of USB mics don't have. Yeah, nice. uh, So, yeah, glad to uh, really look forward into, into checking that out. Um, I can't say anything about it, but um, I don't, it might be out by the time this episode comes out. But I'm testing something new from Waves uh, that all I'll say is it is not a plug in uh so Ooh. uh that's um that's gonna be that's gonna be uh interesting to to check out as well um this is what i've been working on yeah that's really it. like i just I was also finished reviewing the ik multimedia arc studio and then yeah i think that's it i feel like there's a plug in i'm um missing oh, i should be getting the uh kit plugins uh, sending me, uh, should be sending me soon there, the stuff that they showed off at NAMM, which, um, oh, what do you call it? It's a drum, drum software where they sampled all the, the drum sounds and you can, you can replace them. Um, blanking on what that is technically called. Sweet. Um, that's interesting to see that coming from, um, from, uh, from kit plugins for sure. Uh, Touchstone, how you been pushing faders up? Uh, so kind of the same. Uh, I got a, uh, some things here that I'm reviewing. I just actually reviewed the uh, Console One MK3 by oh, nice. SoftTube. Um, man, I am really torn 80% in favor of that thing. I had the original Console One, and okay. there was some things that it was lacking, mainly using your ears. You had to be more of a visual person with that. With the MK3, I feel like they've solved that problem to where I can actually just use my ears. And once you get the muscle memory down of where everything is, it's on and popping. So there's a couple of cons that I I said in the the video there uh, that I didn't like. Um, And then there's a plug-in right now uh, by the Hill Company, uh, some of their preamps that I'm actually reviewing um, and I'm weird with my reviews because I like to get them first and like I like to t- spend about three weeks to a month on something and really pushing it and really just figuring it out before I do the review. So that's going to be coming out soon here. Um, and then I'm working on another review uh, for Phoenix Audio, the N90s, the preamps, the 500 series. And those are just killer. I, I would just straight up. Yeah. What, say that again. The uh, N90s by uh, Phoenix Audio, their 500 series. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, man, those things. The N90s, what is what is that? That's their compressor. Um, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I'm going to try to hold that thought. I, I missed what you said because I was going to say something off what you previously said. You said uh, preamps from the Hill Company? Yes, the, the preamps from the Hill Company. So they have some hardware 
And what they did is they emulated uh, the preamps from the, the hardware. And I, I'm not even joking when I tell you this. These are probably the best sounding preamp plugins I've ever used. And I'm a, I'm a plugin snob. And I'm talking about everything from UAD to soft tube to even audio acoustica, which doesn't get much love, but I really like their plugins. Mm -hmm. This stands up on its own. And I don't know what kind of algorithm they used, uh, but just as needless to say, if they know their own products, it shows because these sound fantastic. What's the model preamp? I'm trying to think if I'm thinking of what you're talking about. I, I want to say it's the M50. They have the the M50. Uh, don't quote me on that. I, I can send it to you afterwards, but um, it's the M50 500 series. Okay, well, no, 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 no. You said M. Okay, no, you said Hill Company. I think I'm thinking of Hill yeah. B. I think Hill B. That's what I'm talking about. You're talking about Hill. Okay, it's like the Mo yeah. 67. Yep, that's it. Okay, so we are thinking about the same thing. Cool. I have a pair of Mo 67s. Oh, um, nice. I got a pair of Mo 67s, the uh, the cream and blue ones, or actually I think they're blue, cream and blue now. I think mine mm -hmm. has got a black knob on it. But uh, from my understanding, that preamp was like pre-API, or that preamp became yes. API, and then they switched out the op amps or something like that. Um, so yeah, I, I have a pair of those, and I've I've been curious about the um, I've been curious about the the plugins because and i did see them at nam and it's funny because they recognized me because they saw my video on the review of the mo 67 and i know there's the cream and red one so I, that must be the m50 then i don't know the yeah my name of that that's the motown one i think yes that's the one I, I, man bro killer hmm. killer all right i'm you see, you make me want to check them out. Cause I think they're even, I mean, the discount code probably still works, but I, they had some kind of discount code for NAM or something mm -hmm. for the plugins. Mm -hmm. But I was kind of like, I'm curious about them, but I'm like, I really don't need them. But <laughs> if you, <laughs> you vouch too, for huh? them, <laughs> <laughs> you vouch for them, I might have to check them out. <laughs> you too. I, I, I'm in that space, man. I have so many plugins. I'm like, what the heck? You know, I'm mixing projects here, and this is the weird thing. I love these plugins. I'll try them. Uh, I'll use them. But when so, when a client sends me some work, I go right back to my my get it done. I know mm -hmm. the plugins that work. Mm -hmm. I already got a chain set up. I know how they sound. I know what they do. Know how to push them. I'll do that. And it, that's that's kind of the weird thing. It's like when I want to start to substitute something in my chain. It's like okay. I need to work with some of my projects to where I'm not under a time restraint because, you know, when people send you stuff, you're, hey, okay, cool, this is, I'll have it done by this time, this time, this time. Or they're like, hey, I need this done by X, Y, Z. Cool. Um, you don't really have time to experiment. So you got to really do that on your own stuff or, or when you have time. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's the kicker there uh, between making content uh, for YouTube and then making content for the podcast and just still wanting to be creative as a producer or artist, you got to find that time to experiment as well. So you can continue to grow because I know that there's been parts of my life to where there's been habits and routines that I had that served me extremely well, but they started giving me diminished returns. Uh, the more the future went on because those techniques became dated. Uh, mm. Those plug-in sounds became dated. And so you got to find time to keep, to give yourself a ROI uh, over time because you're going to start to get diminished returns from old habits, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, and then to go back to what you said about Phoenix audio. So in, in NAM they introduced the, I forgot what they're calling it, but it's basically a 500 series ascent. Yes. Um, with, a one knob EQ. Mm -hmm. um, I hate I missed that because I walked by the Phoenix Audio booth like three or four times, and <laughs> just you know all their gear looks the same. So you just you, you know you walk by booth and name, and you take a quick glance. Like, is there anything new? Nah. Okay, yeah. keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and you know I get back to Nashville and I see this video new from Phoenix Audio, and I'm like, what? <laughs> How did I miss that? So because um, my thing, I. I I uh, commented on your, your Instagram post about the Phoenix Audio because I, I got the Ascent EQ. Uh, I got a killer open box deal on it from Sweetwater. I had always been curious about Phoenix Audio. 
uh, I got it, and I think right after I got it, I had got COVID. So I wasn't in the studio for a while, and then when I got back in the studio, like I, I didn't try it for like, I don't know, five or six months after I bought it, because when I got back in the studio, it just became business as usual, using what I knew, and I'd never really, you know. Finally, I was like damn it, I need to use this because, you know, it, at this point I can't return it. I don't even know if I like it yet. <laughs> so, yeah, I got to using it and I was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 we're good. Yeah, we're good. I, I love Phoenix Audio. Um, they're probably, uh, gosh, it's, it's, it's hard to say. It depends on how I'm feeling. But they're one of my favorite hardware manufacturers uh, because I like how – passive aggressive their stuff can be like uh, the neve stuff when i get the neve stuff it's really aggressive their compressors are mm -hmm. really grabby so i know what i'm getting and then the api stuff it's like super laid back it's smooth uh it can be grabby but it's really punchy and the phoenix audio sits right in between those both it's like if they both had a baby phoenix audio would be it and uh i really like how like uh phoenix audio can give me punch for drums but the API will give me like this low end presence. So I'll combine them and just kind of just get that really, that really nice force. So they're probably one of my uh, favorite plug-in manufacturer, I'm sorry, hardware manufacturers. I will tell you, they came out with a piece called the Theta. That looks interesting because um, like in my studio, I run all of my hardware outboard gear as far as like synths and keyboards through their DI box. And then I run their DI box into my interface, and you can drive their DI box. So if you're working with some strings on the motif or some drums on the MPC, you can drive those inputs and then kick back on the output coming into your interface and get that big, like, thick, luscious sound. So they have a, they have a box called the Theta, which is like a summer and a DI box in one. So you hmm. can use each channel as you see fit and hit it with some widening, hit it with some some uh, transformer. It's pretty dope. And from the from what I understand, they have a transformer going in, and they have a transformer going out. So it gives you more of that console sound coming in, especially if you're wanting to sum it. So I'm very interested in that. Nice, nice. Yeah, I've been using mine on really just been mainly using it on on, on vocals. I don't EQ. I very very rarely eq um when i'm tracking vocals because I, I feel like if i need to eq that i'm using the wrong preamp or mic yep. but yep uh just being able to kick that that sheen in a couple db just to add some air on top is has been great um yes it's not Agreed. i don't like dark preamps and yet the phoenix with it being a um with transformless input you've got the transformer on the output I can I can drive get that saturation on the output if I want and I just I love versatile versatile uh, preamps. It's got a lot of headroom too. I like that too. Yes, yes, agreed. Yeah, and I, that's great you say that because that was one of the things that when I first put it on, I'm like, why does it sound like this? Why is it not? It's the headroom. <laughs> you you can kick it up. You can drive it. And I was like, oh snaps, this is dope. Yeah, man. Definitely. All right, we're going to get into some, or a, a listener question here. Uh, Waves from YouTube wants to know, uh, strictly for rap vocals, warm WA-1B or uh, the, I call it modern classic, Empirical Labs Distressor. WA-1B or Distressor strictly for rap vocals. What, what, would, you, what would you go for? Um, gosh, this is going to be a hot take. I don't like the warm <laughs> stuff. <laughs> not a fan <laughs> um I've, I've had all of their stuff and i've it's ended up selling it um i'm gonna go with the distressor on that because i've worked with the distressor handily and i know how versatile that thing is and how you can get the most out of it um and they don't skip on power supply that's the that's mm -hmm. that's my biggest thing with warm so that's how they keep their price down is that they um they skimp on their power supplies, not trying to bash anyone, but this is just my knowledge of it. Um, mm -hmm. So you got places like Revive Audio. Um, and uh, I think I forget the other one, but people like Revive Audio that do these mods. And it's usually like on the, the warm stuff. So and you look at the mods, they're replacing 
the power supply. And if you like look at an original Neve or like an original API, those power supplies are huge. Even with the manly stuff, their power supplies are huge, uh, not with the warm stuff. So I'm, I'm going to go with the distressor on that one. All right. I do. I'm I'm tough on warm just because a lot of time it's they, they clone stuff that I just feel like we don't need another mm-hmm. one of. Uh, but I do like the WA1B. I, I've had I've reviewed one for I had one for a couple of months when I was reviewing it. And um, I, I got to say, it's probably my, my favorite warm piece that i've ever tried before really but, yeah I, I was i was impressed i was impressed with it um the but for strictly for rap vocals like the distressor is so versatile like i don't yep. think there's another compressor that's as versatile as the distressor so based on that versatility i think i would go distressor as well because you the distressor can be clean but then you can add some uh saturation to it you've got that opto mode you can put it in i love opto compressors yeah yeah and it's just it's so much you can do with, with a distressor uh so yeah i I'd, I'd have to go i'd have to go with the distressor on that one as well yeah yeah i'm gonna check right. out the uh wa because i i seen your review on it and uh, I played with it a little bit, and you, you know, to be fair on that one, I I haven't like used it, used it, you know, mm-hmm. I haven't dug into it. So yeah, yeah, I'm gonna check that out. Yeah, I, I guess you know, a, a lot of their clones, I'm like, yeah, we don't we don't need one of those. But the WA1B, there's not another CL1B clone out there. So like, that's the one. And it's funny because. Um, I, I emailed Warm like years ago. Uh, cause I think they put out something saying, "What should we?" I almost said clone next. What should we make next? <laughs> <laughs> and my answer was the, was the CL one B because like I don't know I don't know if, I don't know if patents expired on it or something. I don't know, but no, like I'm just surprised that no one has 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 done that. So right, but, yeah. I was I was impressed with it. I was impressed. I was like, oh. but like you, I I get Warm gear. It's cool for a little bit, and then I always say it's good until I get something better. And I, I had that the part. LA, <laughs> I had the LA two A, and then I, I sold it and I got the Elop, um, mm. which is just mm. in a whole nother league. <laughs> That's a huge upgrade. That's a quantum leap. <laughs> yeah, a whole nother league. Uh, um, the Pool Tech, um, I sold it and got the West Audio. L C E Q P, which is the West Audio pull tech. Yeah. Um, and that one is act is is an actual passive EQ. I found out that the warm is not passive. Um Interesting. That's it. Yeah, I think that's the only two that I had. Um Yeah. Right, we're gonna uh, move into our main topic of uh underrated gear. We're just gonna discuss some gear uh, that we feel is underrated. Uh, so the first question I'm going to ask you here is uh, what makes a piece of gear underrated to you? Or you know, how do you define underrated? So that's a great question. The if, if I have a piece of gear and I feel like it's underrated, I would feel just basically sometimes those underrated gears are out of most people's price range. So they don't know about it. Um, or it's one of those pieces of gear to where it says it's an EQ or it's a compressor, but you might use it for another reason. So it's like, yeah, this is a, a compressor, but we use it as this. And it's mm-hmm. so underrated for that. Uh, or it's just one of those companies trying to compete with one of the big dogs. And they're just trying to find their 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 footing. And um, that makes it underrated. Yeah, see, for me, un- underrated to me is, is gear that I'm like, why is no one else talking about this? Mm. <laughs> like, why don't I see other people with this? And, um, yeah, to me, that, that definitely make, makes it underrated. Because I like to not, I don't like to use stuff that everyone else has. Uh, which, Agreed. for example, is another reason I was interested in, like, the Phoenix Audio. I don't see Phoenix Audio in every studio, you know. So I'm like, oh, I, I stay away from... Um, and that's another reason. That's why I went with the Hilby Mo sixty seven instead of an API. <laughs> it's something something different that not yep. everyone else has. But yeah, that, that's underrated to me. No one's talking about it, and I don't see um, a lot of people with it. 
So with that out the way, let's let's start with the uh, microphones. What's what's an underrated mic uh, for you? Ooh, that's a good one because there's a lot. Um. Okay, so I'm gonna throw a curveball here. I'm gonna go with the the uh, Townsend Sphere. I know UAD rebranded mm. it. And I feel like it's underrated because of what it's doing, uh, the emulation part of it. And once you really take, because the mic on itself is, is standalone, is a great mic. It sounds good. Uh, mm -hmm. your, your mic is really good. And based on what uh, type of preamp you have with it as well um, can affect it. But I know that that microphone for sure. Uh, works better with like clean sounding preamps because of the emulation. You don't really want too much color on those. But for what it's doing, I really think it's like future thinking. It's a it's more of a um, experimental microphone that worked well. So the emulations that it does are uh, most times spot on, if like not one or two percent off, which you can make up with some sort of EQ, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I feel like that's underrated for the, especially for the price that it is. Gotcha. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, the Aventone Pro BV-1, which is mm. their uh, large diaphragm tube condenser that they came out with the end of 2022, I think. Uh, but it has been in the rotation of tube mics for me, and I just I don't see many people talking about it or with it. And it definitely stands up to more expensive tube mics to me. And what really, what really got me, because like when I, and I said this in my review, when I think of Aventone Pro, I don't think of like high end uh, microphones, but yeah, that one definitely deser deserves uh, to be in the discussion. Um, you know, I like it on male vocals and female vocals. Mm. Um, it's just a great uh, tube mic uh, for me. Good balance between uh, clean and colored too. It's, to to me, I feel like a lot of people don't realize is that you can the more color you add, you will lose clarity, or you have a, a very high chance of losing clarity. For sure, message. For sure. So <laughs> you're adding that color, and you you're losing clarity. But with the um, yeah, with something like that mic, it's got it's got a little bit of color, but it still keeps that clarity open top in yeah i i really like that one i think that one's overrated love uh, that. or under underrated i think that one's underrated uh you got another one um <clears throat> this is gonna this is gonna be crazy but there's a microphone that i don't even know if they sell anymore but it was the uh the groove tube gt55 that oh, microphone the <laughs> I thought you was about to say the G. What did what did I have? I think I had the GT fifty seven. I know I didn't have the fifty five. That one too. Remember. That one too. Fifty seven. Okay. Yeah, the Groove Tube stuff, man. They made some really really good stuff. It even their preamps were dope. Um, I know Ken Norton. Um, or I'm sorry, uh, Ken Lewis uses their their preamp a lot, and he he's made hits upon hits, you know. Um, but their GT fifty five microphone was killer and i i still like that mic to this day is that was that the tube one it was it was okay. no it, so it, yeah it was yeah it was okay so i think i had the gt57 which was the fet one mm. which um i just i wasn't using it uh I, I ended up selling it to someone um but um yeah because I, I ended up pick, i think i picked up mine for like 300 dollars or something sweetwater was, was blowing them out and i really looking back on it of course hindsight being 2020 i should have got the preamp because like they were I, I guess they were they were just clearing them out and uh i was looking at the preamp too but i was like uh i need a new mic i was like 300 i'm like all right yeah. uh let me see another one uh another mic i'm gonna say is underrated is the road broadcaster Ooh. which is their broadcast condenser mic um I don't see it's been around for a while. I don't I don't really see people with it. Um I picked up one from Guitar Center used for a 
couple hundred if that. I think the I think brand new they're like four thirty nine. I think I got mine for like two hundred or something like that. And really, oh, I was so yeah. excited to found to find one local. Um, like looking back on it, I probably should have tried to talk them down because like nobody was checking for that mic. <laughs> I probably could have <laughs> got it for like one sixty or one seventy for sure. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that one is underrated. I, I feel that Rode makes uh. Very good broadcast mics. I have, I now have the pod mic. I have the Procaster and the Broadcaster. Uh, so that, um, yeah, that one is that one's definitely, definitely uh, underrated to me. Nice. Let's see. Move on to uh, preamps. What you got for a uh, what you got for a preamp that's that's underrated? <clears throat> so I got a couple. All right. Um, so the first one I'm going to go for is one that was kind of near and dear to my heart. It's actually a channel strip with a preamp, but it was the PreSonus Eureka. Um, oh. I used to have that, and I really love that thing. I should have bought another one. It, it made a pair, but that one was dope. Is that uh, the that blue one? It was like the silver one with the blue knobs. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, that one was dope. And then the one that I have right now, uh, the API 3122V, the stereo channel preamp, that's killer. And and I don't see many people talking about it, using it at all. Like, Two channel, um, okay. Yeah, when, when, um, when I got other producers and engineers who I talk to who are much more famous to me, much more bigger than me, uh, I send them a mix and they call me and like, yo, what, what, what'd you use on your drums? When I tell them that, they're like, get out of here for real. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that thing is super underrated. Uh, just for the fact that API saturation to me, uh, when you add it um, on the input and you kind of kick back on that output, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty dope. And they have a button here uh, called a three to one. And it's like you hit their transformer. Dude. Yeah. I'm all about it. I, I feel like I still almost remember the day when api finally put an output knob on their preamps and it was like thank you yes thank finally you. <laughs> nothing else matters in life <laughs> yeah oh um that's that's a good one because i feel like most people that go with api go with the 500 series and that's what they that's what they know uh do you remember the api i think it's called the api a to d the a to d no it was a no. two-channel it was a two channel. I can't remember if it was a three twelve or five twelve, but it was a two channel uh, API one uh, U with um, an A to D converter in it. So it was API preamps for the front end, but it had a digital back end where it, was, where it had an a, a to D converter in it. Um, yeah, that's um, that was around for a while. I'm sure it's been discontinued now. Um, but yeah, see, underrated to uh, preamp that's underrated to me is the. And I'm blanking on what I was going to say. I know uh, the little Chandler Little Devil preamp. Oh, dude. Yeah. I don't see many people talk about that one. Um, that one's been around for a while. I think they still sell it. But that is a very colorful, hi fi sounding uh, preamp. Uh, that I love. I use that a lot on um, on rap vocals. And then probably one that's the biggest underrated preamp, I feel, is the uh, Mic Tech MPA 201, which is a two-channel. Mm. Um, they'll call it British sounding. I don't know. It really doesn't sound like a, a Neve to me. Um, it's more open than a Neve, but, man, it's just thick and smooth and... Um, it's probably the first thing I reached for in in the studio with vocals. I ended up getting a, a killer deal on it, in um, at Guitar Center. I, I'd walked in Guitar Center. I can't remember why I was even why, why I was even because anytime I go in Guitar Center now is for cables. Like I don't go in Guitar Center to buy anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. But um, I need cables that day. I gotta go. To right. <laughs> gotta get them. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times they don't have them. But anyway. Yep. <laughs> That's true. It's so true. <laughs> you go in guitar center like, yeah, I need it. Like, uh, 
true story. I was in there a couple weeks ago, and I was looking for a, a 10-foot cable, and they're like, uh, we don't have 10-foot cables. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> We've got five feet and 15 feet. And I'm like, how do you not have a 10-foot XLR cable? I'm like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah She's yeah, like, oh, you know, you can... You know, you could just have some extra slack. I'm like, no, I'm not paying for an extra five feet. <laughs> yeah, no way. No way. Especially uh, if it's Megami. That's going to charge us like another hundred bucks. <laughs> Anybody's going to bust your head for cable these days. But Yeah, man. Um, I'm in Guitar Center, and as I walk in, uh, there's a tube tech uh, piece that catches my eye in this glass case. And I'm like tube tech i'm like when did guitar center start selling tube tech okay. so i walk over there and it's um and i'm looking at the tube tech and then i realize it's a case of used stuff i'm like oh okay and then i see the, the mic tech preamp which i've had my eye on for a while anyway i was actually gonna probably purchase one at uh at sweetwater that year but they had one used and it was 5.99 that preamp i think brand new is 1500 I think there was a time that it went down to like twelve hundred. I think they hit it for five ninety nine. I'm like, uh, does it work? So we take it out the box, we power it up, and I start pushing buttons, and then it hits me like I know Mike and Mike Tech. Like I said, Mike Tech's a Nashville company. I'm like, if it is broken, <laughs> I'll just take it over there, take right over there, <laughs> have them fix yeah. it. It is um, like the the top and bottom of it was beat up. Um, but you know, nobody sees that once you put it in a rack. So that's true. Yeah. Yeah. For five ninety nine though, that's, um, and I got two channels of it too. Yeah. That's a, that's a very underrated preamp, uh, nice. in my opinion, for sure. Uh, let's see. Compressors. what you got for compressors? Uh, we were just kind of talking about that. The, uh, Phoenix audio in nineties. Okay. Those are just awesome. Uh, they're so versatile. They're awesome. I love that for compressors. Um, is that a, a VCA and, compressor, I'm assuming? Yeah, it is. Okay. It's, it's the uh, VCA style here. Um, the color that you, you get, but uh, you can back off of it. It's just, it's very, I'm, I'm all about it um, for compressors. And then, here we go. Here's another one. The API T25 from their Select ah! Series. <laughs> Stole yeah. my thunder. <laughs> really? Did I? I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh my <Hey>. god. <laughs> yeah, dude, that one is yeah. killer. I love the tubes on that. The tube vet, and I just run things through the tubes for that. It's incredible. It's incredible. I love that. Yeah, I like just I don't know. I guess as engineers we have been programmed to when you hear F E T you think eleven seventy six. So Yep. That's kind of the first thing when I started using it. I was like, Man, this don't sound like an 1176. <laughs> <laughs> but then the more I use it, I'm like, man, this this is doing its own thing. Like, yes. okay. I'm like, all right, I'm good with it. I'm cool. Yes, for sure. I and love yeah, that one. I was definitely I was definitely going going yeah, going with that one too. I don't see many people talk about that one. I'm actually thinking about taking mine down. Uh, to the studio to um, just pair it with that in, uh, mic tech preamp, uh, mm. just to have two two channels of tracking compression. Um, I'm I'm thinking about, I'm using it less and less for mixing now, uh, so I'm thinking about. And I've been looking for a two channel compressor to pair with that that preamp for uh, for tracking vocals. So I might, yeah, I definitely might look into uh, look into doing that. Yeah, see, that's dope. I uh, I run my T25 into the Fusion, uh, the okay. SSL Fusion, mid-side mode, so I can have that warmness on the sides uh, mm. because the mid-side just turns any piece of gear into mid-side mode on Fusion. So I'm just like, okay, it's got independent two channels, so I'll unlink the channels and just kind of do a dual mono mid-side mode with that. It's pretty dope. Nice, nice. Um. Uh, well, the other one I was going to go with is the, uh, kind of sticking with API, but technically it's the, the JDK V12, mm. which JDK line became the API select. Um, what is it called on the API select? I think the SR22 
or maybe the SR12. The JDK, I'm look it up just to be sure. Uh, the API select. Uh, so the 500 series one is the API select SV12. Okay, so that became the oh the 12 that was yeah from, yeah that compressor. I love that. Comp- I use that to track uh, rap vocals, and I've been using that for years to track rap vocals, and I haven't I haven't switched out to anything else because it just it works so well. It's just a all purpose general compressor. It's an automatic attack and release, so I don't have to fool with that. It's mm-hmm. got uh switch for hard knee soft knee um you know something a little more aggressive i go to hard knee a little more laid back soft knee easy to dial in um i feel like i should have bought two of them almost because um i guess they fixed the issue now because api told me that um my guy api uh leaned over to me at nam one year's like uh he's like you still got your v12 and i was like yeah he goes good he's like keep it because we can't make anymore i was like what he's like yeah they i guess they, they weren't able to get a part or something. Uh, so I, I saw a couple on Reverb, and I was like, "Do I do I want to grab this?" Yeah. Um, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah, but now they've came out with it with the um, the API select line. So I I, yeah. I guess whatever issue they had, they were able to uh to to resolve it now. But yeah, I was um uh, that one is definitely underrated uh, to me. And I think if I don't know anything about the Paragon console, but that that's supposed to be the the compressor from the Paragon console. I think like the mm-hmm. mix bus compressor for it or something, because there mm-hmm. is a two channel one, too. But um, uh, well, yeah, two channel one. Um, that um, that is the SR twenty two. Yeah, it was the JDK R twenty two. Yeah. So yeah, I was, I was I was looking at getting the um the rack one too. Cause I feel like, cause I'd, I'd see them for a good price sometimes too. Cause like, you know, people ain't really checking for it, Yeah. but, uh, mm-hmm. definitely a, a really nice, uh, VCA compressor there. Uh, did, did you have another one on the compressor side? Uh, well, kind of. Oh, you said the, too. You said, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just go, the, if the, you got one, go ahead. The, uh, compressor from the fusion, the high, fil- the high filter compressor, the high frequency compressor that, okay. um, that compressor is killer. <laughs> it just when I put it on, man, it just does what I need it to do, and I'm like, I don't even have to really set anything. This is great, mm. you know. Uh, that one right there for sure. Nice. Okay. Uh, let me see what we got next. EQs. Uh, we got an EQ that's underrated. I do. Um, I don't see a lot of these, and I don't see a lot of people talking about them. But the uh, the the Better Maker Passive Stereo EQ. Mm. The, they're kind of their pull tech emulation. I I love that thing. I, I really, really do. And the main reason I like it is because it's further up in my rack to where I can't really reach it, but it's okay because it's plug in controlled. Yeah. And <laughs> that to me is dope. And I just love the way that it sounds, man. I'm actually looking to get another one here, you know, because mm. nice. it is stereo. You know, um, Mine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say. Um, actually, let's go ahead and stick with the JDK API. Um, mm. I, I got two, but the first one is uh, my JDK R24, uh, which is now the API Select SR24. It's from nice. pretty much uh, same, same thing. Two channel EQ again from that uh, I think Paragon console. Um, and just a quick story of, about it. I picked it up at Gear Fest one year, and uh, this is an EQ. There's no shelf on it. All of it is bell curve. Um, four bands, and I used to, for a long time, it has uh, API output transformers on it. For a long time, I ran mixes through it, even if I wasn't EQing. I would just run mixes through it, and. When I got it from Sweetwater, I wasn't a hundred percent sure. But like most gear I buy, like I'm a hundred percent sure. Like, yeah, this is this is what I want. I was like, eh, kind of iffy on this, so I bought it. And I'm like, uh, how long I got to return this if I don't like it? And you're like, I don't, I don't know about this. We got it back to Nashville. It was me, me and my master, my mastering engineer had went up to Sweetwater with me that year. We went to a Blackbird and rented a Ooh. A Designs hammer. Was it was it the hammer? 
I forget the other one that they it was the hammer and something else. I think it was the hammer. Um, rented it. Yeah, it was a two BQ. Yeah. And let me see. I think I paid like a thousand for my JDK EQ, and that hammer was like twenty two hundred or whatever. And this is back like we're basing gear off price. And my master engineer was like, that A designs is going to kill the JDK EQ. And I was like, yeah, I know. I just want to see. I, I just want to compare them. Well, uh, in everything we ran through the JDK one, the, it just it just it was more open. Um, mm. The A designs was a little dark. Um, and I just I, don't, I, I couldn't believe it. And And really from that day, I'm like, OK, I'm not going to judge gear based on the price anymore. Right. So right. They they um. But I, I emailed my sales rep. I'm like, yeah, you're not getting this back. <laughs> you're not getting this back. And so <laughs> yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely an underrated uh, EQ uh, to me. Um. And the other one is my West Audio uh, LC EQP. It's the West Audio Pull Tech. Yeah. Um, I don't see a lot of people yeah. talking about it. It's been discontinued now, but I have a feeling, um, I don't have any inside knowledge on this. It's just my, I just have a feeling, uh, that West Audio will bring it back as a NG, um, as a, you know, plug-in controllable because they did that with the 1176. Now they've got the, I think they're called the beta. I think their 1176 is called beta, but they have their 1176 yep. and then they came out with the uh, I don't know if it's the exact same thing, but we'll just say in 1176 that's plug-in control. So I wonder if they're going to do that with the, with the uh, with this pull tech. But what I love about this pull tech is that we all know that pull techs allow you to boost and cut the same frequency. You have one frequency control for the low end. This West Audio has two frequency selectors. It has an independent low frequency selector for the boost and one for the cut. So I can boost and cut at different frequencies. And Sweet. I have never seen another pull tech be able to do that. Sweet. I bet that gives you some really cool tones. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. I'm going to look into that. <laughs> <laughs> look into that. That's, that's a one. You got a, um, did you say one? Or did you? Yeah. No, you said I the, uh, the, uh, uh, kind of the other one. one. It's yeah. the Heritage, the Heritage Audio Symphony, Symphony Q. Like, okay. I, I, I dig Heritage Audio, and the reason I really like that EQ is because the midside mode is – I get it in a dollar wide end, but the filters the filters on that EQ are the smoothest filters hardware-wise that I have ever used. I don't know what they did, but the low and high filters on those things just really round out your mix, and I love mm -hmm. those. Even if I'm not EQing anything else, I'm using those filters, period. Now – I don't know much about that one. Is that based off of any hardware, or, or is that just Heritage Audio doing their own thing for a two-channel EQ? Yeah, so that's uh, based off like a a, a Baxhaw uh, EQ. Okay, okay. And it is it, it does every bit of that, and it sounds really, really good. Uh, even I've noticed just like running things through it without even EQing anything, it has like its, its own sound. And I've I've done that on a couple of tracks. It just sounds mm. good. Yeah, man, that's yeah, that's um, that dangerous back CQ. I remember they came out with that, and everybody was going crazy over it. And I was like, uh, it, not to say that it is, but it looks a little basic for what this cost <laughs> is. Yeah, the cost, dude, the cost. <laughs> So when they when they came out with the, when was a plug-in alliance came out with the plug-in I'm like yeah I'll, I'll go with yeah. that <laughs> yeah yeah dangerous stuff I got their compressor here which I love I use it on every mix every single mix even on vocal recordings just uh, recording live in it it's 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 a, awesome because it doesn't get in the way but it does what it does right it's mm -hmm. controlled um, the the cost of dangerous stuff is <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> I, you know, I know Merrick and, and them and them guys over there. I I know them uh, personally, um, but dangerous man, they don't they don't like. I don't see them on really any kind of sale ever. You mm -hmm. know, um, that's why they, that's why you got to go to Gear Fest because you can get stuff maybe ten fifteen percent off at Gear Fest. That'll work. 
that'll work because it's better than nothing. But right, yeah, and the dangerous stuff yeah. is just always. They're like manly. Their stuff is always yeah. expensive. <laughs> well, at least manly, I've seen go on sale though. Manly does run sales because I think that's when I got my elop. Yep. Um But um, because I have the dangerous D box, and one of the things I wanted was was it a sub? Yeah, I think it's a sub control. And there's some other features I wanted on the D-Box. And I kind of emailed Dangerous about it. Like, oh, you should look into putting this. And they're like, eh, no. Nah. I'm like, all right. So they, I ended up running my D-Box, which we know is a monitor controller as well, into another monitor controller so I can have, like, um, desktop, within desktop reach of my monitor controlling um, and have access to a sub at the time. But... Yeah, the danger is the D box. I felt was very fairly priced for what all it did. You've got two D D to A converters, eight channels of summing, monitor controllers, two headphone ports. Like that was great. And then they came out with the we call it the Gen Two or the D box. And I'm like, that's what I yeah, run. The features. That's what you got. I'm like, yeah. the features are cool, but as a OG D box owner, like I don't feel like I needed that. Or you know, like I've already. Uh, the shortcomings of the original D box, I've already fixed that by adding something else. So yep. the only thing I would really want from there is the um, that, that that standalone dangerous monitor controller. And I'm not paying two thousand dollars to no way. turn my monitors up and down. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. That, this is that's another piece of gear. How right. <laughs> Good. Um. Let's see. Yeah, that's all I had for EQ. Um, uh, what we got next? Channel strips. You got any any channel strips? I know you said the the Eureka from Eureka Presonus. Earlier. Yeah, um, the API channel strip. Mm. That that to me. So you get a pair of those. You're you're in like Schwinn, straight up. That everything is like running it through like um, uh, API console. Just one two channel two channel strip there and even I, i've been looking into getting that and they're using the same preamp that they're using in the 3122 uh the 3122 v here and i'm just like man okay so i get the eq which is 500 series get the compressor get their pre and they got some other features on there as well yeah that's that's worth it to me uh as far as the channel strip goes i'm, I'm curious the I'd have to just look. I'm not about to do the math now. But if you hit a lunchbox where you put a, a 312 or 512, if you basically built that API channel strip, mm -hmm. two channels in a lunchbox, I wonder how that would be. Versus, that, that would have to be cheaper than getting the two of the rack units. It, I, I would say so. It would have to be, Because the, yeah. the rack unit itself is like 3,300. 3, okay, 3, yeah. 3. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely then. Okay. Um. That's one I've looked at that the five twenty seven I've looked at for a while too. I, mm. I've looked at uh, getting that out of curiosity just because I, I didn't really see people with it. Um, and now you got me thinking about that again. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't see anybody with this compressor. I kind of want to check it out. But it's, it's weird to me that the gain reduction goes up instead of down. I don't know yeah. why the hell they did that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah, know if they're just sure. trying to be different, but <laughs> as engineers, when I think gain reduction <laughs> down, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> so that kind of turned me off on it. Honest. I'm like, I don't know if I'll ever get used to this. <laughs> yeah. For Am sure. I looking at the input or the gain reduction? <laughs> like, what are we doing here? Yep. Agreed. Um, yeah. So, as far as you know, the channel strips go. Um, I'm I'm into that. I know that the uh, the Neve channel strips, their Newton and their Shelford gets a lot of love. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be honest. I might be in the, the minority here, but I've had the Neve bus compressor. Um, I've had the Neve. Uh, I'm sorry, bus processor. I've had a the a couple 1176s here, and uh, it was one of those things to where they're very pricey. So when I pay something that's in that price range, pay for something that's in that price range, I feel like I want to use it on every mix. And it was mm -hmm. one of those things I couldn't use it on every mix because sometimes it was real. It was much more aggressive than I would have liked. So mm. 
I, I've gotten away from the Neve sound, and I know I'm in the minority here, but I feel like some of their stuff is just it's it's an acquired taste. Let's just say that. Mm. Yeah, I wasn't uh, not the Newton, whatever the newest channel strip they came out with at Newton. What is that? The Newton is that the? I think so. Oh, let me look it up. Let me see Newton. Um. Is that the more affordable one? We'll call it. Yep. That's yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Not having, not having control over the tack and release. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of a deal breaker for me, and I wasn't really crazy about having a VCA compressor in a channel strip either. Mm-hmm. Um, just mm-hmm. that, and I haven't used one, but that Dio Bridge compressor that they have just looks more interesting to me yep uh, i guess just because i've never used a dio bridge um before but i definitely we all know that or maybe we all don't know but a vca compressor is the most affordable one to make uh so i definitely see why they're like when i saw the price of it i immediately knew that it was a vca compressor in there mm-hmm. i was like oh 2000 i'm like yeah yeah but i do like the <laughs> um their, i do like their preamps the, the 511s um i do like those um, let me see. Channel strip for me though. Um, the Empirical Labs Mike E. Ooh. I don't really see people with it. Ooh. Don't really see people talking about it. And I, I still track vocals with that channel strip. That was like one of the first like pro pieces of gear I got. I was looking for Avalon 737. I'm like, I got to get a 737. But if you know, if you've used a 737 before, or, or if you've transported a 737 before, they weigh like 50 pounds. And at the time I was moving studio to studio, I was talking to, I think I got mine from Sound Pier. And um, at the time, Empirical Labs had a sale. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, man, this is one rack. It's got to be lighter <laughs> than the Avalon. And I got it and actually got to compare it to an Avalon and I liked it more than it, yeah. the, the mic pre is really clean, um, which is kind of as expected because you have the compressor saturator section and we can add saturation. Um, nobody does compression like Empirical Labs. <laughs> so having that Empirical Labs compressor on there, that's one I use for rap vocals uh, a lot too. Agreed. Um, but yeah, I, I love that. That channel strip is definitely um underrated uh to me uh, back to your point there and i i just wanted to second that no one does compression like empirical labs <laughs> um not saying that it's better or whatever but mm-hmm. their compression is their compression and i and i love that i mean for it to basically be a, a uh, yeah it's got to be a vca compressor um because if it was opto or fet they would say that yeah. Um, that thing can do so much gain reduction and you do not feel it at yes. all. Yes. Crazy. Like I can do probably 12, 14 dB of compression and you know, you don't know it until you look at it. Yep. And you're like, Oh shit. Yep. But then, but then you sit back and you're like, it sounds, but good. It so- it sounds good though. <laughs> it sounds good. <laughs> you're like, damn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for real yeah well yeah um which does ma- it makes me curious to uh i want to try out the, those new pump compressors the 500 series one um that they've got i think they're shipping now or if not they're getting close to shipping but um but yeah and, and actually uh i've gone back and forth with do i want a distressor because the mic e has less attack times, less release times, than a, and less ratios than a distressor, but I can dial it in a lot quicker. Mm. And at times, I feel like I don't need a distressor because I have that Mikey. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, really, when um, and then when Softube came out with the the plugin, I'm like, oh great! I yeah. I then took my Mikey down to the studio and left it there, and like I can just I'll just use the plugin at home, and I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. What do you say? Like, so that's one of the questions I have for you. Like, I, the more that I've become seasoned at what I do, I am actually preferring more uh, plugins with less knobs and hardware with less knobs 
that just I can just dial in fairly quick and get that sound. Um, I'm noticing like the more knobs there are on something, the more I want to play with it. <laughs> you know, and I was just getting to that point. So it was like, okay, that's what he look. said. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm man, loving that. I I feel you because I I I have been leaning more towards simplicity. Um, at the same time, like those single knot plugins and stuff like that, I'm like, I don't want this beginner ass yeah. plugin, you know? Yeah. Oh but, my God. <laughs> but like the um, oh, what is it called? The the Sonox Vox. What is it called? Damn it. Um, I gotta look it up. The new Sonox. Uh, they've got like a it's like a two button or two knob. Uh, there it is. Voca, Sonox Voca, that thing sounds so good, and it's only two knobs. Yeah, man. Uh, I do lean towards. I have been leaning more towards simplicity and not liking stuff that um that has a lot of buttons and knobs, like the um, oh, what is it? The, the SSL? Is it the Bus Plus? Man. That's got a lot going on. It's it's got too much going on. Like I've I yeah. watched the video of them going through all the features, and I'm like, I'm not gonna remember all of this. Nah, nah. <laughs> that kind of turned me off. To be, I'm glad you brought that up. I was gonna buy one, and I was like, that's that's kind of a lot. I, uh, that's a little too much, you know. Um, and and go back to your point. There's a there's a plugin from Eventide called Da Boom. I don't know why I, I got that. Works. Yeah. I yeah. don't know why it just works, <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> you know what I'm I love that thing. And it's I don't I don't use them, but okay. Um, here's is a uh, off, little off topic, but so was Waves One Knob series ahead of his time? Because <laughs> people yeah. trashed oh, yeah. the One Knob series for being you know yeah. so simple, and now it's like that's what a lot of people are in. That's what we're into now. Yes, uh, the the one knob <laughs> stuff was ahead of its time. I, I would uh, <laughs> concur for sure. You know what I've seen on a lot of templates that people don't really talk about is that that uh, saturation knob from uh, Soft Tube, the Soft one tube. knob thing. Yeah, yeah, dude, I see that on a lot of people's yeah. chains <laughs> for sure. I'm um I'm actually um it's on my to do list, but I'm I'm doing a YouTube video on like the best like one knob, um plugins out there uh let me know when that drops i'm, I'm gonna be looking forward to that for sure <laughs> yeah um last well not last yeah yeah last one we got here is plugins um it's kind of nice segue there but um do you have any any plugins that you feel that are are underrated Ooh, uh yeah actually there's a couple um the msed the um, the mid side ED I forget who it's by. Hold on, I could tell you right now. Yeah, I haven't heard. I haven't heard of that one. Uh, Voxingo, it's a okay. it's a company and it's a free plugin. And what it does is it turns any sound, um, anything you have into mid side, and it's absolutely incredible. I love that plugin. Um, I use it on every track, and it and it just brings up some of the sides on some things sometimes when I feel like it's lacking and it gives me a happy balance on that. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And then the, um, I like the, the soft clipper from, um, Apogee. That's another free okay. plugin. That clipper is amazing and it sounds so good. It's the smoothest clipper I've ever used. Uh, I use it on a lot of things and it just gives me that room, uh, to really like push my mixes, push my mixes out. Um, and then I would say my last underrated plugin here would honestly probably be the console one. I, I mm. love the console one because I can get, I can shape and get to a mix with, with 60% efficiency and very fast. I love those. Yeah. There's, Oh, hold that thought. We're going to come back to that in a second. Um, Mine, I'm just, I'm gonna go with a whole brand for mine and his kit plugins. Like Oof. I don't think they get enough love because I've Agreed. compared them to Waves, I've compared them to UA, and 
they are I don't know what they're doing with their algorithm or their modeling how their stuff sounds so good their Neve 1073s they've got the API channel now um, and then they've even got their which isn't um, like uh, the core series the core EQ core compressor which is more like a general use EQ general use compressor um, and they just all sound great fantastic Dude, they got the uh, Blackbird too yes the, the, yeah yes they do the Blackbird oh, yeah, yeah. stuff yeah, I love that one. By the way, yeah, I don't think they, um, man, like they. W- once I started using their Blackbird Neve channel strip, I used to use the um, Sheps seventy three from yep. Waves, which, which I yep. still like, which is great. But yeah, compared to the the, the kit plugins, just does a little bit more, um, and it just it sounds so good. So yeah, I I, I think their whole line is um, definitely uh, underrated. Nice. I'm All glad right. you brought them up. <laughs> um, that out the way, let's go back to that um, the console one. Um, I might be able to get my hands on that to review it. I'm curious. I don't. I, like, I feel like I don't have enough desk space in, in front of me now because I've got. Um, well, I, don't know, I guess I could put it on my. I mean, I don't know. Left side. I, I don't know. But that's kind of what I do. I, I ran out of desk space. I actually even said that in uh, my overview of it is like something had to go. So I got rid of the SSL <laughs> UC1. That, Ooh. Uh, yeah. I had to get rid of that one. I still love the plug-in. I still use the plug-ins. But as far as the hardware control, I was like, this. I either keep the UF1 or the UC1. And I use the UF1 way more. Then I use the UC1 just because purely the transport controls on this is phenomenal. The jog wheel on this is phenomenal. The UF1, I guess F is for fader. Is that the one? Is that the With single the fader? fader? Yep. Okay. And then the UC1 yep. was like the channel strip bus compressor. Yep. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that was genius to me. Like, like there. So yeah, my my meaning my yeah my meaning for going back to that thought is that it's like that space that. Uh, DAW controller, plug-in controller space is really starting to heat up because I love what SSL did with theirs. It, like that really gives you the feeling of mixing on an SSL console. Agreed. Um, but if I had to choose between the two, soft tube is just going to give you more because you have more plug-ins in that soft tube yes. uh, lineup. Um, and they work with UAD plugins. Nice. Um, Nectar is coming out with one that I saw at NAM last year. They've almost finished. I think it's actually up on Sweetwater now, but it's a plug-in control. Uh, is there? I think it's one fader, but it's a uh, C. Is it uh, the CS12 channel strip mm-hmm. and DAW plug-in controller? Um, it's only three ninety nine. Okay, yeah, it's not shipping yet. It says coming soon, but it is. It's up on. Uh, Sweetwater site now, so yeah, it's coming soon. But it, you can, it works with any third party plugin. You can map it to any third party uh, plugin. Um, it, going back to SSL, what they announced at NAM this year was being able to control like the Waves SSL, the UAD SSL, uh, in the um, was it the SSL 360 software? Yep, killer, killer. That made me want so, to get the UC one again. But <laughs> Death Space is such a premium. And I find myself using the console one MK3 more uh, because they got a tape preamp on here that mm-hmm. you can just hit on every channel and it sounds so good. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah I'm getting more use out of I, that. And I still don't, and they might do it one day. And if they do at this point from, from this day on, they will definitely be considered as late. Uh, but I feel like waves should have made that product years ago. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> they could have had a stranglehold because Waves was prime and ready. And some of the, the decisions they made recently, we all know, was was a little questionable. But I agree with you. If they would have made that product earlier, I mean, they, they would be it. They would be the <laughs> company. And this, I mean, my only thought as to why they didn't do it because i just feel like it'd be so complicated because there's so many waves plugins like how was your gonna how are you gonna control and then they have weird functions too like it's not just attack release uh ratio threshold like they've got weird controls so um 
I feel like mapping that it, it would ta- it would take a lot of work, but I would definitely I would have I like I wouldn't be now, but I would have been interested in a plug in controllable um a plug in controllable unit from Waves because I have the Presonus Fader Port Eight and there's um the pan knob on it. I can hit a button, I hit link, and then whatever my mouse hovers over I can turn that pan knob and it'll control that parameter yeah. of the plug-in. Yeah. So I love that because I don't have to worry about mapping a whole plug-in to it. I can just hover over one parameter I want and turn the knob. And yep. that's, I, I love, that's that's great. That's been really good enough uh, for me. But I have, I've been interested in the, in, in that soft tube console ever since uh, the first version. I've been kind of, I've been kind of interested in it. I think you would like it. I, I think you would like it a lot. I got rid of the first version uh, in in light of the SSL stuff. Uh, I got the UF8, UC1, and UF1. I was like, okay, cool. This is this is dope. Uh, now that they've opened it up to other plugins, that was my biggest gripe about the UC1, which mm-hmm. is why I got rid of it because it was like, ah, oh, it's only you know these two, and then that bus compressor. But the console one controls so much in its in its kingdom of plugins. I was like, okay, console one it is. And then when they came back out with this MK3, one thing I will say is that they really stepped up is the feel of it. The mm. actual knobs on it feel like actual hardware. And that it just makes it, it, it just feels really good. Um, and I love how they've integrated their screen so you can see it. But um, it reminds me of the SSL UC1 to where, I'm actually using my ears to mix. I don't have to look at anything. So it gives you the option to where, okay, you want to look. And then there's been times where I'm using a console one and something sounds good and I look up, I'm pushing it. I'm like, oh, (laughs) if I would have been looking at that, I would have never went there. But just by hearing it and feeling it, I went there and it sounded good. Nice. Interesting. Yeah, And I'm, I might check out this, this Nectar uh, because it's a good, it's a uh <laughs> it's a good size that's what she said <laughs> <laughs> but uh i should be able to easily put it cuz and it might replace my fader port 8 um at least for a little bit just testing it out cuz um mm-hmm. i got this fader port 8 because i am a studio 1 user um obviously it integrates great with studio 1 um but I don't use the faders. <laughs> you know, I don't need eight faders, honestly. Um, so, yeah, that's now, now I think about it. Um, still, my mind, if I need to move a fader, I, I grab it in the DAW, not the. I know. Not the fader right in front of me. I know. <laughs> I know. That transition is crazy. You know, it, it's, it's, it's wild. I, I, you know what? I wanted to ask you this. So, you, 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 uh, you use um, Studio One, which I do as well. And okay. I know that the SSL works, their SSL stuff works great in Studio One. But what do you feel about, how do you feel about Reaper? Because there's things I've been looking into Reaper, and a lot of the DAW controllers, which we're talking about, work mm-hmm. the best in Reaper for some reason, and I'm not sure why. Interesting. Um Reaper, I well, I don't think I have it on this iMac. I've tried it before, um, and I just I haven't I wasn't able to get into it. Um, and when I say I wasn't able to get into it, one thing that that drew me towards Studio One is the very first time I opened it up, and I went to messing with it. I didn't really have to look for anything. Like everything yep. was right where I expected it to be. Uh, looking at you pro tools but uh, <laughs> everything was right where i expected it to be and it just made it so easy to use that i didn't have to dig for stuff right um and where is reaper once i opened it i'm like i i couldn't really get around it quick enough whereas because if i got to do a lot of digging i'm gonna get off it <laughs> i'm totally gonna get off agree. it quick <laughs> totally agree. um and so yeah, I've I've heard good things about Reaper. I just couldn't um I I tried to cuz I think I had was something mm, I think that may have been before I got into Studio 1, but I think I had an issue with Pro Tools one day and I got mad 
and didn't feel like troubleshooting. And I'm like, okay, let me just move this session into something else. And I think I tried Reaper and I just couldn't, I couldn't get around what I needed it to do. Uh, Bitwig has been kind of interesting to me. Very. Um, yes. I haven't, I haven't had that issue with Bitwig where if I'm looking for something, I can easily find it and uh, get around it. I just haven't set in it enough to really, really do anything with it. But, you know, I've opened it enough just to play around with it and, um, and, and mess with it. But, um, yeah, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't get into Reaper. Yeah, man. I, I, I totally agree with you on that. I couldn't get into Reaper, but I'm just like, I'm wondering what kind of code they run that makes it work with dog controllers so well. Uh, and once again, here's looking at you pro tools, uh, instead <laughs> of just like avid stuff, you know, um, I, I was a big pro tools advocate. You couldn't tell me nothing about pro tools. I was their guy. And then um, Logic Logic 10 came out, and I moved mm. to Logic 10, and I was like, whoa, hold up. This is <laughs> this is nice. This is real nice. And I don't keep crashing talking about my uh, <laughs> digital audio engine ain't working. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, so I moved over to Logic, and then from Logic, I went to Machine Software okay. uh, for the longest because I got the Machine Studio there. And that was that was my jam, and then um, I got off of that and went into Ableton, and I that's where I create. I've I've stayed there mm -hmm. for the I've been there since like 2018, 2017 now, uh, in Ableton. But I mix I mix my bigger projects and everything else in Studio One, and and I love it for that. But I recently have gotten into Serato Studio. That Ooh, I've got that. Is um, interesting. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and check that out. I don't think I've used it in over a year, but I I think I had it in its very very early phases, and I was like, "This is cool. This yeah, is cool. Man. It's dope. It's really really dope. It's easy to get an idea started and going mm -hmm. in that. And I'm I'm starting to get deep with it, and I it forces you to think differently and create differently, which I'm actually a fan of. I like it. Is it a little more like a DAW now? Because I remember when I first started messing with it, it was it was more tailored towards creation than actual editing. Yeah. So the, with the new update, it is starting to be tailored more toward a DAW. I would okay. still say it's more of a, like a groove box editor creation mm -hmm. station. Uh, but just getting that core idea out. And I don't know what, for some reason, it sounds good. Just mm -hmm. the sound coming out of there. I'm like, uh, this just got this nice little sheen to it. I, I can dig that, you know? It's kind of got that Pro Tools sheen. Uh, I'm not the Pro Tools sheen, but the uh, FL Studio sheen. It's got that mm -hmm. sound. Um, but, you know, it forces, it, it reminds me of the NPC software. When I work inside the NPC, it just, your, your brain has to work creatively uh, mm -hmm. in a different way to get the sound that you want and it's not necessarily better it's not necessarily worse it's just different uh which you know your ideas be different mm -hmm. so matt do, do you have pro tools i do okay. i do still yeah. i've been thinking now that now that they've brought back perpetual licenses i've been thinking about because i think it's like 199 i think That's it's, exactly it's like 199 it um i'm like eh, I bought okay. it. Okay, I I'm, bought I'm it. Definitely, I'm definitely thinking about it. Um, really, more so just to keep up with what they're doing for my YouTube channel because I know, I, I know I'm, I'm not going to really use it. But um, yeah, I've, I've been, I've been going back and forth with with that with that idea. Yeah. Well, I think it's a good idea. I mean, we're professionals. And the clients that we work with, that, that's one of the things. I try to stay sharp in Pro Tools. I stay sharp in FL. I stay sharp in Ableton and Studio One. Um, and those that's are my dogs. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. I know, man. <laughs> MPC Studio, too. I stay sharp in that <laughs> and just really learn those those shortcuts and whatnot because sometimes, you know, um, when, I, when I do take on clients, they're not the most tech savvy and they don't know exactly what stems are. All they know mm -hmm. is how to send over the session. Yeah. So, you know, I'll be like, okay, cool. That's cool. Send the folder. Um, and I'll go into Pro Tools and I'll do what I need to do uh, in Pro Tools. And I don't know, you know, Pro Tools still got like a, 
like they tug on my heartstrings sometimes because I loved it at one point in time. Mm -hmm. It was my jam. Um, but Studio One for me is just like they do the simple things so well. Like, for instance, hardware delay compensation is built in to your pipeline. It mm -hmm. is not in, in Pro Tools. It, it just doesn't <laughs> work well. Um, routing your buses, it automatically mm -hmm. routes it in Studio One. Mm -hmm. It does not in Pro Tools. And I'm just like, why are you guys still so archaic in certain mm -hmm. things? You know, so that not that's, only that's what gets me. Not only does it route the bus for you, but Studio One turns up the fader too. Y yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Simple things, just the those little ease of life things that make a world of difference. Like, and it makes you think, like, okay, I created this bus. Yeah, I do want the fader up. <laughs> like, why would I want the fader down? I need to hear it. <laughs> I need to hear it. <laughs> Wow. I can blend it at my taste when I want to, but I need to hear it, you know? <laughs> so just those simple things. And, and mm -hmm. uh, I like what I, uh, a feature that I love in Studio One um, that I see not a lot of people talking about is scenes. So you go mm -hmm. on the side and you create your scenes. And so I'll, I'll mix a track one way. So I'll mix a vocal out in front, save that as a scene, create another scene, and then mix the vocal inside the music save that as a scene and then create another scene. And then so you can switch between your different scenes and then have all your different mixes of how you had the vocals. So if a client comes mm. back and says, Hey, you know, I want I like to divert. I want to hear my vocals out front a little more. Cool. You don't have to do a save as create new session, do all that. It's saved as a scene. You just go right to that scene, hit it. It has all the plugins. You can remove plugins. You can do whatever you want in that scene and it will save it. To me, that's genius. You talking about scenes? Are you talking about like the new version? Save version as? No. So on on the side of Studio One, when you hit, I think it's F four. It pops open that that side window. There are you. There's a scene button and there's a plus under it, and you can hit the plus and it will save your mix as different versions. So it's almost like a save as, but it's right hmm. in the same session. It's pretty dope. I haven't I haven't fooled with that yet. Um, I definitely love the. I love the. You can save different versions because with Pro Tools you have to save different uh, session files. Where yes. Studio One it's all in one session file. You can just revert back to a previous version. So that's always great if I'm doing like an instrumental or acapella, clean version, whatever. I can just it's yep. all in that one um, session. Uh, one of my favorite features. Um, I don't know if Logic does this, but um, I, I know Studio One does it. Um, when you bounce something, are you on a uh, Windows or Mac? I'm on Mac. Okay. If you notice, when you bounce something in Studio One, it pops up in the Finder up front. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if Logic does that, but I noticed that one day, and I was like, "Man, this is this yeah, is so life. helpful." Instead of yeah. having to bounce something and then navigate all through the Finder to get it. to that folder <laughs> where the session yeah. is to get that file. Like, yeah. I was like, "Oh, this is." This is, this is nice. Yeah, I, I think that's what I like most about um, Studio One. It, I can beckon them to the like the Apple of DAWs. Um, they they do some cutting edge things, but most of the times, uh, what they do, they do very very well, and they have this convenience factor about everything that they do in Studio One that just makes them so efficient. And they that's what they remind me of, like the iPhone. The iPhone does things that are just convenient and doesn't get in the way. Like once a DAW starts to fight back and get in the way, like you said earlier, a Reaper, if I got to go click six buttons just to get to what I'm doing, uh, no, 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 because you're going to, you're going to need to do something in speedy time and that's just going to frustrate you. Mm -hmm. And I feel like studio one does not get in the way. It just, it's just there. And, and then I, I can't say this about any other DAW, Presonus listens to their customers. Absolutely. They listen. Absolutely. I, uh, good luck with Logic. Good luck with Pro Tools. <laughs> yeah. Um, who else is out there? <laughs> like, you're not, the closest uh, that might be to, to Studio Win is maybe ImageLine, FL Studio. Yeah. But they still do their own thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, if, correct me if I'm wrong. Doesn't Studio One have like a section to where as a user you can go 
and put recommend certain things and it can get yeah. upvoted as a feature. Yeah, the uh, their forum. Yeah, on That's the forum. That's incredible. That's mm-hmm. incredible. Let's like go. They actually look at that and they will add. Um, and if I was, and I think they did at one time, but I mean, if I was pre I was when they do add new features to Studio One, I would say it like we've added twelve um, user requested features. You know, I, that's how I would would phrase it, so people know that they are they are listening because I guess yeah. maybe the average user may not know that but um i mean the um that version that save version as that i'm talking about with that feature um when they first came out with that feature in studio one you can save different versions but you had no way at all of knowing what version you were in Mm. the um my workaround for that was i would make a marker at the start of the session and i would name it mix 1.6 Mix 1.7. That's the way that I would know. And I was talking to Rick at Presonus, and I was like, hey. Because <laughs> to me, I'm not a coder, but it just seems easy enough. When we do different versions, why can't it be at the top uh, of the session? At the top of Studio One, it'll say Studio One, name of your session, and then the version. And he was kind of like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so they implemented that. <laughs> That's so dope. That is so dope. Yeah, you're right. No, no other dog company's doing that. <laughs> They're not listening. They're not listening. They're like, hey, buddy, thanks for buying our product. We'll have our people. Right. Our people. <laughs> you know. Right. All right. We're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. Um, Touch tone. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Of course, I'm gonna have your uh, info in the show notes so y'all can reach out and keep up with what he's doing. Um, again, don't forget to uh, rate and review us on apple podcast and spotify and don't forget to join the discussion with this episode and more on the uh facebook group of uh, faders up podcast all right thanks I'm for Zor. having me yeah thanks no for problem. having me i appreciate it <laughs> very much welcome all right i'm czar you go ahead and say your name Oh, I'm touched on. I'm by the way. I didn't mean to botch that, but yeah, I'm touched on DSG guys. Yes, yeah, we'll do it one more time. I, it's weird because I'm normally here with my other co-hosts, and we have this like order that we all do the outro in. Gotcha. Um, yeah. All right, I'm Czar. I'm touched on DSG. And uh, we will catch y'all next episode. Uh, let me see. Stop. Uh...